Our scripture passage this morning is a familiar one coming from the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, verses 25 through 37. Listen, hear, and receive God's word for us. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he, had come, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever you spend. Now which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus replied to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The story of the Good Samaritan is familiar to most of us. The story is about how the most unlikely person came to the aid of a man who had been beaten, robbed, and was lying all but dead on the side of the road. In biblical times, Samaritans were considered anything but good. The Jewish community looked down on them because they were of mixed ethnicity and considered impure and ignorant. And additionally, the city of Samaria was known as a place of refuge for criminals And after years of harboring these supposed criminals, Samaria had a notorious reputation. In the past, East Liberty was considered a notoriously dangerous neighborhood where good people would venture in to work, to worship, to shop, and then they would leave as quickly as possible. According to some, nothing good was considered to come out of Samaria Nazareth or East Liberty. The East Liberty community and the people were considered people and a place to be avoided at all cost. I want to ask you a few questions. Do you have neighbors that you avoid, that you don't say hello to? Neighbors that you feel are different, unlike you or the other people in the neighborhood in which you live? What causes God's people to treat others with disregard, indifference, or downright disdain? What would cause people to be fearful of, to shun, or other a neighbor, someone who lives right next door? Those aren't rhetorical questions. I want you to take a moment and think about it. Now this is a point in the sermon where most sermons take a turn and we start to accuse the religious leaders, you know, the priests and the Levites, because they failed to fulfill their obligations as men of God to care for or render aid to the man who was lying in the road, much like we failed to render care and concern for people who live next door to us. Not only did the priest and the Levite neglect to aid the man, 
they crossed over to the other side of the road. They did not offer a greeting or a simple hello. They did not bother to look over in the direction of or to speak a word of kindness or concern. I imagine that the priest and the Levite lowered their heads and walked past as quickly as possible. And if we're honest with ourselves, we would do the same if we encountered a person lying on the side of the road, beaten, robbed of their possessions and all but left for dead. How many times have we walked as quickly as possible past a person whom we consider different from us? How often have we turned or lowered our heads rather than saying hello to someone on the street? How frequently have we looked at others and made assumptions about them or simply ignored them? Most of us, if we're honest, exhibit dismissive, fearful, or disdainful behavior every time we enter the doors of this church. We lower our heads. We look in the opposite direction and we ignore our neighbors in the rain garden. We don't greet them with a hello. We don't bother to ask how they are doing today. We have never invited them to come into the church to sit beside us in worship, nor have we bothered to sit down and share the space with them. And we certainly haven't asked them if there's anything we can help them with. Most of you know by now that I will receive my doctoral ministry degree on Friday. And my thesis is titled Mutual Belonging, Extending Radical Hospitality to Community Residents in the Rain Garden. And it examines what hinders or prevents EOPC members from extending radical hospitality to the community residents who sit in the rain garden all day. Most EOPC congregational members who participated in my research fear the community residents, fear our neighbors. And some of the reasons that were expressed are, we don't know those people. Some of those people are under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And some of those people have mental illnesses. The concerns are understandable but our neighbors in the rain garden are literally lying outside the front door of this church. They are people who have had complicated lives. They suffer from disease, from the disease of addiction and mental illness, and they gather there seeking companionship, camaraderie, understanding, and connection. Aren't those the things we seek when we come inside the building? Today's scripture passage, in today's scripture passage, a man has been robbed, beaten, and lying all but dead on the side of the road that led from Jerusalem to Jericho. That road was so dangerous that it was known as the way of blood, as people were often beaten and robbed there. The road was a place that people avoided at all costs. And if you found yourself on that road, you would try to stay safe by walking as quickly as possible, and you certainly wouldn't stop for any reason. Such was the behavior of the priest and the Levite. They may have had good reason for passing the man lying on the side of the road. You see, he could have been a decoy lying there to get them to stop so that others could beat and rob them. Perhaps the priest and the Levite were on their way to worship, and if they had come into contact with a dead body, they would have been considered unclean and unable to enter the temple. Or perhaps they were on their way to another emergency and figured somebody else will come along and help that man. Or perhaps they were just afraid and did not want to get involved. Fear is one of the ways that we protect ourselves. If something appears to be dangerous, avoiding it keeps us safe from harm. And yet there are times when we are compelled by spirit and called by God to get involved despite our fears. Now, according to Google, Nelson Mandela, 
Susan B. Anthony, Oprah Winfrey, Amelia Gephardt, and Rosa Parks, they all achieve great things despite their fears. I also found a compelling article that said that assuming people who achieve great things overcome their fear is false. false as one definition of courage is to be afraid and do it anyway. Most successful people are still somewhat afraid, but they don't let fear stop them. If you'll indulge me for just a moment, I want to share that I was extremely afraid and fearful when I realized that God placed a call on my life to preach. I was fearful because I was taught that God, taught to believe that God didn't call women to ordain pastoral ministry or to preach. I was fearful that I did not have the financial resources to pay for seminary and that I did not have the scholarship or the wisdom to complete a theological education. I was fearful that I would not measure up to other people's standards or expectations. I was fearful that I would not be received as a woman standing before the people of God. Yes, I was afraid, and some days I'm still afraid, and I do it anyway. The Good Samaritan, he had a lot to fear when he stopped to render aid to the man lying on the side of the road, and he did it anyway. If you attended the All Church Retreat earlier this month, you heard Pastor BJ share on Friday evening that the Good Samaritan stopped that day because he knew how it felt to be ignored, how it felt to be othered, to be treated with disdain, left behind and ostracized by proper society. In other words, the Good Samaritan had figuratively been left on the side of the road by others who felt him unworthy. And yet, the Good Samaritan embodied mercy, love, and compassion on the road when he stopped just because he saw another human in need. Now, Memorial Day is tomorrow, and most of us will get together with family and friends, we'll host or attend a cookout. Some of you may take road trips, and of course there's those Memorial Day sales. Memorial Day is the official kickoff to the summer season. But more importantly, it is a day set aside to memorialize everyone who has given their, life, their lives to keep us safe. The first Declaration Day, as Memorial Day was known, recognized the men who died in the Civil War. And since that time, that day has been set aside to remember people who lost their lives fighting in battles and wars across the centuries. I imagine the people who lost their lives in battle were somewhat fearful. They thought that they might not make it back to their homes and loved ones as they marched to war. Or at the very least, they considered that they might be injured. And yet, they did it anyway. Fear causes us to stand still, to turn our heads and to walk away. And fear causes us to miss the opportunity to truly be the people of God. Fear causes us to ignore our neighbors in the rain garden. Fear causes us to walk quickly past them rather than to stop and see them, see their need, their humanity, their desire for companionship and camaraderie. When flight and fear are our responses, we do not extend radi the radical hospitality that we so profess. We do not exhibit the love of God. And we are not compassionate and caring and good and all the things that God created us to be. The lawyer or the scribe who asked the question of Jesus, who is my neighbor, thought that he had all the answers, and he did. 
He just wasn't living the life of a believer by loving God with all his heart, mind, body, and strength or loving his neighbor as himself. There are times when we think that we have all the answers as well. Hmm. And if we do, we realize that there are a lot like the, we, that we are a lot like the community residents in the rain garden. For we too live in a broken world. We all bear the marks and scars of being left on the side of the road by someone. And sometimes we engage in behaviors that dull the pain just a little and seek the companionship of others. Conversely, there are times when we are the perpetrators of othering, inflicting pain and marginalizing people who do not look like us, but people who nonetheless are loved by God. Beloved, God is calling us to go, not to solve anyone's problems, not to be doctors or counselors or clinicians or healers, but to go and extend radical hospitality, to exemplify our relevance as a Matthew 25 congregation, to go and show our neighbors by our presence that they matter to go and love them just as they are because God loves us just as we are. Do not fear our neighbors. And even if you do, go anyway and extend radical hospitality. Love them anyway. And when you go, recognize that you don't go alone. You don't go alone, for God will go with you. In reality, God is already there. Amen. <laughs>